Across the globe, we have seen nations approach this crisis in varying ways. While most have decided to lock down and shut down large sectors of the economy, some are taking a bit of a different tact. So tonight we wanted to take a look at two of those nations, Sweden, which you could say is locked down light, and Germany, which has invested heavily in testing. Both nations are relying heavily on their citizens to act responsibly. So how are they doing? As Ian Panel reports, the results might surprise you. London, Paris, Madrid, Rome. COVID-19 has brought much of Western Europe to its knees. Claiming the lives of tens of thousands of people, shuttering entire economies, even infecting some of its leaders. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been moved to the intensive care unit after his condition worsened. Normal life as we know it has stopped, but not everywhere. Remember this? Going out, eating, drinking, socializing? Well, in Sweden, they're still doing it, albeit at a safe distance. Unlike all of its European neighbors, Swedish policy is locked down light. Citizens can still mostly go about their lives, the government entrusting its people to just use common sense. The difference in shopping right now is that I have to remind myself to keep distance, which I'm not really good at, but I'm trying. To communities across America battling this invisible enemy, these scenes may seem unbelievable, dangerous even. But the Swedes have a very different approach. From the outset, the authorities trusted the people to do the right thing and have tried to keep life as normal as possible in abnormal times. The tradition in Sweden when it comes to health care and, and public health has very much to work with voluntary measures to have a dialogue with our population, to give good advice and, and tell people what we're trying to achieve, not telling them exactly what you should do in every, every situation. Frederick and Annika have two young children. They both support the government's policy. I think that it's impossible to keep people locked down for a long period of time, and everything points to the fact that this is not going to be over in a couple of weeks. But it doesn't mean there are no impacts. In Stockholm, it means Annika's seven and eighth grade students come to school once or twice a week. The students really miss school. Um, they, they love to be in school when they are. Um, it, it, it's kind of hard for them to, to cope with distance learning since they haven't been doing that before, really. Då ska vi titta lite grann på realismen idag. But her children's preschool is still open daily. And gatherings are still permitted with caution. We're not really hanging out, we're not having dinners. We actually went to a, an outdoor birthday party last weekend. And that was with the kids that our kids normally see at preschool. The Swedes are still partaking in simple activities the rest of us may have taken for granted before the virus consumed and changed us. And they're doing so in part because of trust. I do have a lot of faith uh, in my government. Uh, I thought in the beginning that it was like kind of lame behavior, but I think that it seems to work. So I think it's good that we can live as we used to. Infections are inevitable, so the Swedes set guidelines like banning gatherings of more than 50 people to try to keep the public safe without upending their lives or their economy. Hoping that when they emerge from this, their economy is in much better shape than those who've embraced a total lockdown. I think we're all using high-risk approaches these days. Closing down society is definitely a high-risk approach. We believe that the slow spread of the virus while the healthcare keeps on working, while society is still in a fairly normal uh, situation, uh, is the best way to, to run this. But the Swedes may have made a catastrophically bad move. The latest numbers show that Sweden's death rate is double that of its Nordic neighbors who embraced a full lockdown. And despite the effort, a recession may be unavoidable, according to the IMF. As the death mounts across Europe and the critics of the laid-back policies are now asking for tougher measures. Germany's also been an outlier, but for very different reasons. Our country has not seen such measures before, and they will, of course, be severe. But they are currently necessary to reduce the number of contacts and thereby the number of infections and severe cases in order to make sure our health system is able to cope. 
methodical and organized. They've been extensively testing, tracking and isolating cases. We have some uh, basic conditions that make Germany maybe more resilient to such a situation. And I would think that one of those is the big testing capacity. Another one is a very strong uh, health system. The testing, a stark contrast from the UK, which was slow to shut down. On the week of March 16th, as Italy reached its apex, the virus had already claimed thousands of lives there. Hundreds of thousands had already been infected. And days later, Prime Minister Johnson only just officially ordered a nationwide lockdown, a move Italy had taken weeks prior. I don't understand why the government didn't decide for time, in time, to protect uh, the, the, the citizens. And now the UK's death rate has reached over 11,000. Even though Germany is more populated than the UK and had one of the first European clusters, their reported number of deaths is strikingly low, just above 3,000. While Germany's imposed restrictions on movements and gatherings, they've been less stringent than other European countries. And much like Sweden, many people understand it's just their civic duty to protect others. I think each person decides for him or herself if he or she needs to go out and have a walk or get some sun. I think it's nice to have some sort of freedom uh, still, it's important to be conscious and stay home for the sake of uh, the health of many people. Around the world, countries are grappling with the balance between lockdown, liberty and preserving economic life. Everyone will be looking very closely at these European exceptions, desperate to learn lessons. Yeah, lockdown versus liberty, really interesting. Ian Panel joins us now live in London. And Ian, we saw those images of Sweden, many people going about their normal lives. But you also mentioned that their death rate is significantly higher than their neighbors. What do we know about their cases overall? Yeah, that's right. And a significant number appear to be focused on and, uh, the elderly, which again was a part of the population that Sweden set out to try and protect. Um, look, first of all, a word of caution. We are not necessarily comparing apples and apples when we're looking at different countries and trying to put together some kind of comparative statistical analysis. Different countries are counting the death rate differently. Different countries are testing differently. And of course, every single country is trying to get a grasp on how to deal with it, how to test as much as possible and how to give honest as you can uh, figures for the numbers of deaths and the number of infections. So Sweden certainly has a higher rate. It looks like their strategy was high risk, but it's also entirely possible that they're including certain people in their statistics for the number of dead that other countries aren't. But on the face of it, there have been an outlier in Europe and there are severe questions as to whether or not their strategy has been successful. However, the important caveat is when they emerge from this, like when Britain and Italy and Spain and France also emerged from this, perhaps their economy, their lifestyle is going to be much better protected. And as a society, they're ready to get on with things in a much better position. And, and perhaps this is a bit of a, another apple orange comparison. But when you talk about Germany, you mentioned their aggressive testing there. But isn't the EU supposed to be a block? I mean, how is it that their results are so different than, say, Italy or Spain? Yes, EU is supposed to be a bloc, but it's always been the inbuilt weakness of the European Union, especially at times sometimes of crisis, uh, that countries tend to act in their own national interest. I mean, there have been attempts, for example, to try and coordinate on uh, acquisition of uh, PPE, acquisition of ventilators, uh, but it's been a very controversial system, and no country can really afford to sit back and wait for group decisions to be made. But interestingly, in Italy, there's been something of a backlash about the failure, or what they see as the failure of the EU, to come to their their aid when they needed it most. In other words, what we've seen a little bit in the United States where you've shifted resources from state to state uh, according to need, that hasn't really been the case in Europe. It has on a small scale, but not enough to justify the EU acting in concert. Had it done so, perhaps things would have been better. You just have to come to the conclusion no one really knew quite how to deal with this, and that's why we're in the mess we are right now. And lastly, it's been another difficult day as far as deaths are concerned in the UK, where cases continue to surge. But elsewhere in Spain, we're already hearing rumblings about some being allowed to return to work. China, as we know, has also lifted restrictions, but, but they're worried about now a second wave. So can you walk us through what some of those nations are doing? 
Yeah, and we're all desperate to know that there is some path, some way out of this light at the end of the tunnel. Just very quickly on the UK, I think what's really important to say, because we were talking about statistics earlier, the UK in its official stats has not been including deaths in nursing homes, or certainly not all of them, and it's about to do so. So its figures are going to go up. So again, those comparative numbers, not easy to justify. But you're right, there is an easing off. I think European countries are desperate to try and get back to business in some way that they can. Uh, China has tried this, as has Hong Kong, Singapore uh, and Taiwan, and they've had mixed results, mainly because what they've seen are nationals coming back into the country, Chinese nationals returning home, students, and they have brought the virus with them. This particular outbreak in China was right up on the border with Russia. Was it be possibly because of cross-border traffic? So there are anomalies, there are questions, but on the whole, it's starting to look better in Asia. Lindsay? All right, Ian, really interesting to look at those different countries and how everyone is responding differently. Ian, panel, thank you so much for that. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.